Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to another Rafael Medina subspecialty virtual morning report. I'm very, very excited for today's session. Uh, Dr. Franco Murillo is actually a very active CP Solvers member and has a very good rheumatology case today. And Dr. Gelber is a professor of medicine and rheumatology at Johns Hopkins. And when Hi. I was applying for... No, uh, right, right. Well, when I was applying for uh, residency, Dr. Gelber was actually uh, in my interview and he was discussing a case alongside residents. And I still remember the case. It was like a PDL1 associated cochlear vestibular toxicity. I had my mind blown. I hadn't started residency yet. And I was like, wow, that's a good program. And I, I should invite this person to come discuss the case with us. So, uh, Alan, do you want to introduce yourself and say hi to everyone? I had no idea what case you were going to mention, Youssef. Now I know exactly. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Gelber in Baltimore. Pleasure to be together. And in the spirit of full disclosure, as I said to Youssef a few minutes ago, that I had the opportunity to work with Franco on the rheumatology consult service at Hopkins Hospital in April 2023. And I'm a proud letter writer for his rheumatology fellowship application. That's what I would call a good conflict of interest. It sounds like a good relationship there. And Alan, I wanted to ask you, uh, why should people go into rheumatology? That's an easy question of which I've heard lots of different answers over the years. But the short answer is from the day we start medical school through our residency training and beyond, we learn about all the different organ systems of the body. In rheumatology, you don't become a single organ focused internist. You retain your interest in all the body parts with a niche that generally unifies those organs by inflammatory rheumatologic disorders. Everything that you learn is still relevant all the way through. Yeah, I love that. I love when I hear those answers and the passion. Uh, Franco, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell them a little bit about yourself and also about your passion for rheumatology. Perfect. Thank you, Yusuf. So uh, my name is Franco. I'm currently at PUI3 in Sinai Hospital, Baltimore. I was uh, born and raised in Peru. Um, I also collaborate with CP Solvers many, many times. Um, I love clinical reasoning. Of course, I think rheumatology is the best school in the world. I'm applying for that. And for full disclosure, the following case, Dr. Gilbert is completely blinded of the case. It's actually a case that we I saw way back in Peru. So it's going to be an interesting day today. That's exciting. We have a travel history already. <laughs> uh, if, if you're ready, Franco, and if you're ready, Ethan, we can go ahead and start with the case. Absolutely, perfect. Uh, okay, so the chief complaint is gonna be uh, bilateral wrist swelling. So this is a history of a 64 year old male. Uh, he presented with a history of two weeks of progressive left wrist swelling that started in the left side. Uh, at that time, he denied any fever, he denied any recent trauma, no insect bite, uh, he didn't endorse any uh, recent sexual activity. He reported uh, that two weeks before the left wrist swelling, he increased his intake of seafood. He was eating outside home. Uh, he also reported that he also increased his intake of greasy food. Uh, when he had the left right, the left wrist swelling, he went to his PCP. Uh, the PCP prescribed him a course of colchicine and ibuprofen uh, that uh, he was taking. And then approximately like three days after starting that treatment, he developed some vertigo sensation. Uh, he went to the ED. They told him, oh, you have PPV. P -P -P um, they prescribed him a short course of uh, prednisone and told him to go to the ENT clinic for further workup. During this whole uh, initial presentation to the PCP and to the ED, he denied any abdominal pain, no change in bowel habits, no change in visual acuity. Um, he basically denied any other symptoms besides the left wrist pain, left wrist pain that was um, consistent of a little bit of swelling on the left wrist pain. He didn't endorse stiffness. He didn't endorse any um, impossibility to do his normal activities. It was just uh, the swelling in there. 
Um, after getting the prescription of the prednisone, he did report that the left wrist pain resolved and that he was able to do his normal life. However, right. one week after that episode, he developed a progressive bilateral wrist swelling um, associated with pain. And this thing, he did endorse morning stiffness. He said that initially he uh, used to go and drive really early to go into his job. But he couldn't do the changes in the in the manual gear that he had on his on his car. Then this got worse, and he wasn't even unable to open doors or jars in the morning. The stiffness and the pain and the swelling on the bilateral wrist. Uh, he reported that it would last definitely more than sixty minutes before a mild improvement. But then through it, through all the day, he did endure the pain and the stiffness in some degree. There was never like a fully resolution of the symptoms through the day. Um, he self-administered Tylenol, Telecoxis, uh, ibuprofen, not at the same time, but intermittent. Like he did a one day of trial of Tylenol, one day of Telecoxis, and one day of ibuprofen with no response. And um, then he started to have less ankle swelling and pain that prompt him to go to the clinic again. I think I will pause there. Thank you so much, Franco. And just one question, how old was the patient? 64. 64 year old, okay. And uh, Alan, we have a message from Reza in the chat. Let's go Dr. Gelber with many exclamation points. Uh, I wanted to ask you, we have a lot of information here. Uh, how do you further characterize this swelling slash pain or how would you want uh, trainees to take a history in re regarding this swelling to help you better think about it? Uh, Yusuf, that's a great question. So I think I have two immediate answers. One is to be as, uh, as calendar specific, as time specific as we can be, the full-time course. Was he 100% normal when he had that meal of the seafood and woke up in the middle of the night with a painful unilateral monoarticular process in the wrist? Or when we ask him if we were the primary care physician, the frontline provider in front, has it been brewing over days or a week? It's really the, the acuity, the onset, the duration, that's one aspect. Uh, and then, uh, and the other which did come up uh, from Franco is even though it's there and it's new, it, how impactful the joint process is on daily activities. And while we all learn early on about incapacitating joint pain or touch me not pain in an acute microcrystalline arthropathy, where there are risk factors in this case for consideration of gout and pseudo gout, but the vast majority of patients who have acute microcrystalline arthropathy are not going to say uh, that I can still, uh, that I'm going to be able, if it's an ankle or foot, to use the clutch, or if I'm going to be able to change the gear shift in the throes of a severe microcrystalline arthropathy. So it's both the exact duration of symptoms, the abruptness of the onset or brewing, and the severity on whatever scale we choose to provide to the patient. Uh, of the impact of the joint process in their daily activities. Thank you. And uh, it sounds like here we have a lot of history and a lot of symptoms. Uh, which descriptors like stand out to you as significant or can help you go closer to like characterizing the syndrome or how are you characterizing it so far? Right. So far, I'm characterizing it as a monoarticular arthritis on my presumption that the process is in the joint, in the synovium, not of a tendinopathy process or a, a bony process or a vascular process, but the joint itself. But it started that way. And then there was a little bit of take it back. It may not be so hot, red, or swollen or so impactful. I did not have an appreciation for associated constitutional symptoms. I'm very interested on any review of system of any patient. How are they outside the affected joint or joints that are involved? Where are they with energy, stamina, appetite, ability to sleep, that dimension? I didn't hear about fever, chills, drenching sweats. And even though we had the social exposure of the seafood intake, 
over the prior period, we were we did not start with a with a case representation of a substantial comorbidity or relevant comorbidities that might lead us to one or another rheumatologic process. We only really had diet and the onset of a monoarticular process. Thank you. I see uh, more has entered, but I wasn't hearing that in the last part of the, uh, the, the box that we're in filling in about the negatives in the review. Uh, uh, Franco, can't wait to hear more. Perfect. I really love how this discussion is evolving. Um, so his prior medical history, he is diabetic. He takes metformin and beta glycine. Uh, he also had a history of a fully treated tuberculosis at the age of 20, was pulmonary. He completed six months of treatment at that time and never had any other recurrence. Um, family history, uh, a sister has rheumatoid arthritis. Social history, he works as a pharmacist and mostly does administrative work. And he was able to do his uh, work before this episode. Uh, travel, he lives in, in Peru. He currently, he resides in Lima. Uh, that's a major urban city. No recent travel. No smoke, no drug, no alcohol use, no allergies. Um, do you want a little more of the physical exam or do you want me to pause there? Okay. So for physical exam, vitals, uh, temperature was 36.6, heart rate was 16, blood pressure 110 over 80, and respiratory rate of 18. Uh, generally, uh, well appearing, he was not on distress, and no, no tyromegaly, moist mucous membranes, uh, cardiovascular, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, no JVD, pulmonary wise, continuous air transmission bilaterally, no wheezing, no crackle. Abdomen, non-tender, non-distended, bowel zones were present, no masses, no palpable uh, organomegaly. Neurowise, Adrenaline times four, he was moving all four extremities and following commands. The skin, no rash, no rash, uh, no plagues, no um, declamative lesions, no papules, no pustules. Um, on MSK exam, he did have a bilateral reswelling with tenderness on the ulnar and radial aspect of both hands, both wrists, also on the left ankle, on the medial and the posterior, and on the medial and posterior yeah. aspect of the left ankle. Uh, PIPs, DIPs, and NCP didn't show any signs of active uh, physical exam, no sign of itis on physical exam. Joint lines on MIP, PIP, DIP, and NCP were preserved. Um, uh, they also did a back, uh, back exam, no kind of like tenderness along the vertebral column. Uh, and I also forgot to mention on prior medical history, so he did have a prior episode five years before this presentation of uh, left ankle, left wrist, uh, similar presentation of pain and joint swelling. That was after a presumed uh, GI infection that he uh, got a course of superfluxacine and then a short course of steroids and improved after that. No other uh, episodes uh, before that. And I think I can pause there. Thank you so much, Franco. And uh, Alan, before I ask you about the case itself, I was wondering, is there like a specific exam you do for every single patient you see, like a rheumatologic exam? Or uh, how do you recommend we approach the physical exam when thinking about rheumatologic disease? I think that uh, the first approach in the rheumatologic exam is to either... Uh, have a particular focus on the axial skeleton, if we're thinking cervical, thoracic, down to lumbar spine, versus the appendicular skeleton. One of the incredible benefits of the human skeleton in the vast majority of people 
is as his story began with a left wrist, he also has a contralateral right wrist. Or we heard from Franco that previously he had the left ankle. How does it compare to the other side? So it's very relevant to inspect and look at the contour now of the left wrist to the right wrist, to the ankle compared to the contralateral side. It's important uh, to then uh, look at the skin for any clues, both locally, is it hot, red, and swollen, or is it a physiologic color, but there's a change in the contour of the affected site? We're trying to get a sense. I'm lifting up my hand for the moment. Does the process seem to be right at the wrist joint? Are there any tendons over the dorsal aspect of the of the hand? Is it on the volar aspect? Even though we've been saying wrist, is there activity going on in the forearm? So we still talk about inspection, palpation, right? We don't auscultate these joints, uh, but we inspect, we don't, and sometimes we percuss. If we broadly define percuss, is it belaudable? Is there an effusion? But we have those three elements of traditional four parameters that we associate with heart, lungs, and, and abdomen. Um, and then I want to say, because the case is particularly about the wrist, uh, it's informative to ask the patient, hold up their hands as if they're stopping traffic. Because what I just did was actively extend my wrist 90 degrees. Can they move their hands? They don't go, they don't flex the full degree and normal as they do as their extension. And then we're trying to move the various fingers, uh, even asking the patient to go through those maneuvers before we actually can put our finger on the affected sites that we're trying to tease apart. Thank you. And uh, what are your thoughts about the case so far? It sounds like it started with one joint and now we have like a possible history five years ago, multiple joints. Uh, I don't know if the dizziness is related or not. How are you thinking about it? I think that uh, since uh, I'm not going to forget that we started with seafood, that this case has a lot to chew on. And therefore, uh, when I'm, I think I'm about, I'm going to try and say four things. When the case started with a single affected site after seafood in an older adult, then even it had been in his 30s, let alone twice that age at 64, with the seafood exposure, we'll always think microcrystalline. I touched on that before. The degree of involvement doesn't seem of that level. We need to remember that pseudogout, calcium pyrophosphate dehydrate loves the wrist. So that's a very common site. It is not common to begin gout in the upper extremities, but not everybody listens to the book. And then we got information later that there had been a prior ankle involvement, which is definitely in the top three gout involvement, not upper extremity as the story was here. So the case began with microcrystalline arthropathy. Uh, my intuition is that Franco is not sharing with us a case of microcrystalline arthropathy uh, on this uh, Monday evening, September 9th. Then, even though we started in one joint and then we had additive involvement of the other wrist, common things that are common, and the crystals are common etiologies, but common things that are common are rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis, with or without having the relative, which I think was the sister with rheumatoid arthritis, is common. 1% of the adult American population, 3 million people in this country, worldwide incidence and prevalence. And therefore, even though in the last decade, the wrist joint is no longer part of the diagnostic criteria for rheumatoid arthritis, it was for the 30 years beforehand. So for me, the joint, that's the poster child of rheumatoid arthritis, because I'm older, trained as a fellow starting in 1992, that when I heard wrist, I will always think of rheumatoid arthritis. You can begin with a single joint and have added a joint involvement. So we had one wrist and another wrist, then we heard about an ankle. Rheumatoid arthritis of autoimmune rheumatic diseases is the most probable consideration. Then we have the fact that he's a man. He's no longer a young adult man, which I would define for many people on this Zoom meeting this evening, 18 to 40. In young adult men, I will always think about seronegative spondoarthropathies. We could name those four if we need to. Uh, but we heard that he had something with an antecedent GI process several years earlier. So we want to keep in back of our mind, was there something earlier in his life to see his genetic susceptibility could it be B27 positive there? Uh, I wanted to say that for completeness. I generally am not a fan of nuanced spondyloarthropathy in the seventh decade of life at age 64. But I touched on crystal, rheumatoid, and I got to Chris, then I got to the B27. So the other place 
that we need to go to, and I agree with Sonia who spoke uh, in the chat, is we have a prior history of tuberculosis. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 minutes, but in the last five minutes or in our final aliquot, we'll still be thinking he had rheumatoid, or sorry, he had a history of tuberculosis. I don't recall. I think it was lung. It was isolated to that part of the body, what the treatment was. I will always be thinking in this case, is it recurrent? Was it totally eradicated from his body or is it back? And it could be an explanation to what happened the five years earlier in joints had settled down and it's back again. So we have uh, that we have that aspect as well. So in terms of uh, of what I would consider um, infectious arthritis, but not acute septic arthritis on the medical service and any of the time zones that we're participating on of streptococci and of, of staphylococci and enteric gram negatives, we have other organisms in all the various categories. In this case, has a flavor of a mycobacterial process. When we heard about the risks, I'll just throw in one more comment and then I'm, and Yusuf, you smiled, so I'll stop talking, which is that if I hear about the risk, there will always be a ABIM, internal medicine and or rheumatology question about the wrist or tendons in one extremity with red tender nodules, with exposure and plants and rose bushes and sporotrichosis and think fungal, but we had no skin involvement at all. So there's, I don't know that that shows up in a USMLE one, two, three, that is an ABIM, internal medicine and rheumatology. No, I actually love your discussion. I wanted to ask you, uh, what would you order next or what would you want next? Like what information would you want Franco to give you and how would you work up this patient? I think that we should, before I lit, the presumption is I'm in the camp. That, that doesn't mean I have this discussion a lot on the medicine service in Baltimore, which is high value care matters, but I'm also in the camp that everybody uh, actually, I guess we didn't define that he's admitted to the hospital because he's, we, I'm not sure that we, but people come in the hospital, there's a CBC, CMP, UA uh, to begin with. So there can be clues there and then we'll let that come out. But since we didn't make a stop at that point, uh, I am so far interested in speaking to everything that we've touched on so far. I'm interested in serum uric acid, calcium level, acute phase reactant, rheumatoid factor, CCP in the context of that discussion, B27. We do want to know and something about your analysis, even though there's not a story of dysuria just because we touched on that issue before. And we need to have some screening microbiologic measures on mycobacteria. That's a very broad statement. I didn't name which assay of which we know that there's a landscape that can be pursued. Thank you so much. And uh, you touched on RA and the uh, ABIM board exam, which I had uh, a few weeks ago. So I just had a question related to that. I had a question that, uh, and in practice, I learned that about 20% of RA is zero negative. It sounds like a hard diagnosis to make. How do you like make that diagnosis? Right. So the first, the number, and then your question, I won't be long, that at best, at the the, at most, rheumatoid arthritis is 80% positive, and that number, which is the 20% negative that you spoke of, in the university medical center. If we screen rheumatoid arthritis in the general community away from university, we may not exceed 50%. So there's a lot more. It's as you come in that the, the frequency of, B, of rheumatoid factor positivity rises, and in university centers, not higher than 80%. So the answer, and that's how the the criteria evolved. I was referring to the wrist used to be in there for several decades and then it left. It's the presence of arthritis in joints for at least six weeks with an acute phase reactant response with examina examination evidence of synovitis. Yes, serology is in there, but you can still satisfy the number of criteria you need to add up, even with seronegativity for rheumatoid factor and cyclic citrullinated peptide antibody. Thank you so much. Radiographs, uh, that... radiographs when there's a duration of at least six weeks, of which we also have additional modalities in 2024, like ultrasound evidence of synovitis. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Franco. Perfect. And I also saw in the chat that Reza say that if there was any pain over the Achilles tendon, no, the pain was on the model I of the of the ankle, not actually on the Achilles tendon. Um, so for the labs, uh, white blood cell count was 
five K, no, no elevated, five eight three zero. A hemoglobin fourteen, platelet one hundred ninety eight K. Electrolytes were within normal limits. Creatinine zero point sixty nine. Uh, glucose was two hundred and ten. Calcium within normal limits. Albumin as well within normal limits. Uh, AST twenty three. ALT30, alphas and GGT within normal limits. They got a UA as well, no RVCs, no white blood cell count, no protein on the UA, no bacteria either. Uh, CRP 2.3, the normal value for that lab is from 0 to 0 0.5, so CRP was elevated. ESR was 22. Rheumatoid factor was 11. The normal values for the for the lab there was from zero to fourteen. Uh, they also got CCPs. Uh, the CCP anti CCP was seven point eleven, and the normal value for that lab was less than seventeen. Is normal. The uric acid was four point three. Um, we do have some imaging as well. So we got bilateral RIS ultrasounds that show bilateral tenosynovitis of the carpal portion of the extensor carpi ulnaris. Also bilateral hand x-ray tubules, uh, mild diffuse osteopenia, no erosion, preserved joint spaces. We got also an ankle ultrasound that show bilateral tibialis posterior tenosynovitis and bilateral foot x-rays that only go left Achilles insertional calcified tendinopathy. And I think I can stop there. And then back to you, uh, just in general, how are you approaching this case and uh, are you thinking about it? Okay, so what's interesting is if we go, we should be sequential and systematic. So had we begun and I'm looking specifically the CBC, it's totally normal. And we're not hiding something in the differential of the leukocytes. Uh, so I also uh, focused on the hemoglobin of 14. And I wondered, why might there be hemoconcentration? Is there some diminution in volume? But then we got to moving to chemistries and we're good in BUN and creatinine. So he is not showing us evidence of systemic inflammation in his blood counts. And I look for leukocytosis, leukopenia, anemia, thrombocytosis, thrombocytopenia in a rheumatology differential, and there is none of that. Now let's move on. We have, I'm going to, I'm just skipping for a brief moment, the acute phase reactants. And I wanted to say that uric acid is normal. Screening serologies for rheumatoid factor CCP for rheumatoid arthritis are totally normal. So now we come back to the, and UA, just because I said, let's be comprehensive. And we had that prior experience could there be any uh, component of urethritis? There is not. Um, um, and we're just keeping the background some consideration of, I'll come back to that maybe in, in uh, one more minute of the HLA B27 arthropathies. Let's go there in a moment. So the part that I didn't comment on yet is the SED rate is normal, uh, but we have a CRP elevation. It's sometimes there's an association of CRP with elevated body weight or, or obesity. Sometimes I like to ask for the fifth vital sign besides the four that are in the top center of weight or BMI. Is there any versus, is it reflective of what's going on uh, with the person uh, in, in the articular sense versus that it's adiposity. And then we have a lot of information in the imaging, both it is not normal for a 64 year old man to have osteopenia in the carpal bones. That person has some type of arthropathy of those four proximal, four distal uh, carpal bones. We have an, and osteopenia is on the spectrum from totally normal to a process that persists and might be sustained inflammation from an infectious or rheumatoid or spondyloarthropathy or crystal, just to be broadly defined, that later becomes erosive or damaging. But we've entered into that spectrum from normal when we call it osteopenic. And then there's a lot of inflammation that is seen, particularly sonographically, in tendons, both in the upper extremity uh, I'm, and in the ankle. Uh, I'm, if if it's helpful for Franco, I'm not sure if the ankle, the, sorry, the ankle and the foot is all that five years ago or that's still active today. So I, I'm a little unclear if we need to bring that back out 
I think now we were the additive left to right risk and five years earlier that we had the, so I'm a little surprised that we have something going on in the lower extremity because I thought the story was primarily upper extremity and, and we can be, and I said, I'd circle back to B27. So yes, we can have tendinopathy with rheumatoid arthritis, no question. And that was the question. And Dr. Siddiqui Manesh brought up the question of the Achilles tendon because spinal arthropathy loves tendinopathy. Now, thank you. And we will uh, just name, because I didn't before, write those four spinal arthropathies, ankylosing spondylitis, the prototype, inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis, reactive arthritis after an antecedent GI or GU infection, uh, and psoriatic arthritis. And we haven't heard anything about psoriatic skin involvement. The vast majority of people, not 100, 75 to 80% of patients have skin concomitant with or preceding the arthritis, but we have one in five to one in four who can have inflammatory arthritis before they have overt cutaneous evidence of psoriasis. So uh, I think I want to stop talking by saying that we have an active process in tendon and bone of the wrist. We still can conceptualize rheumatoid arthritis that would be seronegative. So I'm going to call that a seronegative inflammatory wrist arthritis that's bilateral. The tendons in that earlier episode still make us think about spondyloarthropathy. Somebody asked the question in the chat about uh, B27. I think that's relevant. If I were taking care, I would uh, seek that parameter. And, and so that I don't forget, and it's 733 or 433 on the West Coast, um, and um, which is to say that if there is on that ultrasound, a pocket, a swollen lining, we want to be thinking in the next 20 minutes, is there a microbiologic diagnosis that might be forthcoming in synovial biopsy, in aspiration of any fluid? Were we to do that, we will always send for bacteria. This isn't a case that's made me think so far about virus or, uh, or parasite, but I'm still thinking mycobacteria and fungal. More mycobacterial because of the prior episode in his early adult life. Oh, thank you so much. Love your teaching. And Franco, just to clarify, the both the ankle and the wrist are like from this episode. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so both wrists and one ankle foot at present? Yeah, so initial, initially it was left wrist, then he got the short course of prednisone, then he had like florid bilateral wrist, and yeah. left ankle on, on symptoms for the patient. But yeah. objectively on the imaging, it was bilateral ankle as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Franco. Perfect. So to give a little bit of context, uh, unfortunately in Peru, the HLD27 is a send out to Spain and it takes three weeks. So that cooking in the lab in the meantime. <laughs> um, they also got a CAT scan, uh, an X-ray that didn't show any too much from the chest. Uh, CAT scan of the chest to rule out any active or like a long involvement, although he was completely asymptomatic, but it's fairly kind of like uh, a standard in a high prevalence area in Peru. Uh, that the cat can only show like thick, uh, tiny scar in the apical superior lobe, but no active lung uh, pathology. Um, because of the um, whole aspect of the of the um, tendon yeah. involvement and the inflammatory markers with a negative serology yeah. and the lack of the B twenty seven to be being a send out, uh, the rheumatologist at that time suggested to do a uh, MRI of the sacroiliac joints to see if there is any uh, axial component as well to this. And that was done and the MRI showed chronic bilateral sacroiliitis with reduced inflammatory signs from a prior. And apparently at that time, the patient said, yeah, when he had the episode five years ago, he also got an MRI. And we kind of like dig on that sacroiliac MRI and that MRI from five years ago showed bilateral sacroiliitis with active inflammatory signs. So there was a, a process in the sacroiliac joints five years ago that he uh, also disclosed that had like mild episode of like uh, two weeks of back pain. And then it self-resolved with some steroids and he never had any other back pain episode. And this episode during this time, he also did not complain of any back pain. 
And the MRI showed that there was like uh, reduced inflammation and the findings were chronic compared to the prior one. And then the HLV27 came back also negative three weeks after the follow-up. Uh, however, in the meantime, because of the active inflammation that was unresponsive to NSAIDs, the decision was to start him on sulfalacine. At that time, the preliminary diagnosis was undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy because he didn't have any skin finds from the psoriatic perspective. The MRI, he didn't have the actual component being active to classify him as ankylosing spondylitis. But kind of like uh, summarizing everything, the consensus at that time from the rheumatologist was uh, we can monitor on the sulfalacin, see if uh, the pain subsists, and he completely improved with just monotherapy with sulfasalacin and occasional Tylenol. Everything got resolved from that standpoint. And so far, the working diagnosis for that patient is spondylarthropathy, mm -hmm. most likely ankylosing spondylitis, but there is a background of if he developed any psoriatic signs at some point, he will qualify as psoriatic arthritis. Um, He's doing okay with the sulfasalacin only. Um, in anticipation of escalation of treatment, a quantum interferon was uh, was uh, taken that was negative, and um, because he didn't have any um, long no, sorry, the quantum interferon was positive, but the CAT scan was completely negative, and he didn't have any lung symptoms. So they say that there is no active tuberculosis for him, and he improved with the sulfasalacin. So that. Uh, kind of like the final diagnosis that we had that we have for this patient. Wow! Are what we calling that the final, Doctor Mario Aliquot? That the yeah, that will be my I final aliquot. Excuse yeah. if I didn't want to speak out of order. I just wanted. To... No, no, I, I I just wanted to see your reflections and thoughts about the the case. I have lots of th so. I have several thoughts. Uh, it, by the way, it's fun in life to uh, to be a contrarian, to uh, to to swim a little bit against the uh, the tide or the flow. So I have uh, I have two main thoughts. I'm just uh, pausing on which way to order them. So well, one thought is there is no question that in the last decade the field of spondyloarthropathy including ankylosing spondylitis, where we are not aware of a history of antecedent GI or GU infection or cutaneous psoriasis or Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis. And patients have low back pain, inflammation, MRI was not an imaging modality in 1975, barely in 1985. It is in the last 20 years. There are EBIM questions about that. And therefore you can detect sacroiliitis, which we did. What's my hesitation? I will be uncomfortable with the concept that this man now 64, five years earlier at 59, which even if we're not so nitpicky on the age, he didn't have symptoms at 18 or 40 when I am most comfortable invoking a diagnosis of spinal arthropathy in young adults. And he wasn't in there. So that will perpetually make me uncomfortable as opposed to say, oh, we see MRI evidence. And, uh, and, and the older we get, the more it can be and I don't have any article that I can lean on for teasing apart how definitive the radiology findings are for inflammatory low back pain, sacroiliitis, versus degenerative changes that happen more as we age. We're not talking about uh, lumbar disc desiccation. We're in the SI joints. I heard that. Uh, and uh, of course, I wish right now I'd read an article on what happens to the SI joints in every decade of life, but I'm curious about that. I'm uncomfortable with the age of onset of a symptom. That's all one. Whatever, and we heard the last aliqua. It would, I don't want to save this for seven, my time, 757, which is because he has some, you know, not everybody is airtight, a you know, airtight diagnosis, the perfect key in lock, that it's unequivocal, that it's really important really important to think about the therapeutic interventions. I, I'm not, I don't have any problem with the initiation of sulfasalazine. Somebody at some point might start to say, is a role for methotrexate? What I am trying to emphasize at 741 East Coast time is that the more the patient has, we don't know what's coming next, has recurrent symptoms, they're more symptomatic, they're more episodes, we will 
the, the slope gets slippery on initiating of a biologic drug. When, uh, when TNF inhibitors were introduced, 1998, first New England Journal Lancet on inflammatory bowel disease, moving into rheumatoid arthritis, 98, 99, 0, 2000, 2001, the next set of articles that come out are unmasking mycobacterial disease, unmasking mycosis, including histoplasmosis with people who had prior exposure. So I'm making the pitch for internal medicine learning that, that if we're longitudinally involved in this 64-year-old man, we, we have to sooner than later be saying if there's active disease, we have active disease radiographically and sonographically, that I would make a strong case earlier than later, as in now, for synovial biopsy, stains and cultures. I am ready for, we, we had a quantifieron, we heard about it, that we have a gene expert and a PCR probe for mycobacterial, non-mycobacterial, tuberculous, sorry, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, that's right, TB and non-TB mycobacteria. Uh, and we keep thinking about that uh, in his uh, earlier in life's story and or uh, uh, in uh, his living in South America and in Peru. Well, I love your expert discussion and your discriminating factors between disease and uh, how you even like uh, you as an expert want to learn the different findings on MRI by age. And we appreciate that. Franco, did you have any reflections on the case or any thoughts about the, uh, Adam's discussion? So first, I think the first big reflection is that it's really important to tailor and gather all the information and being like subsequent with when did the process started, always dig deeper on the patient history. They might forget details that we do need to ask as physicians over time. Because for this case, he, he just disclosed, oh, I had a little bit of back pain and then it was kind of like a spoon feeding all the answers for him. So that's uh, part of our job. That's what we, different different clinicians, the bigger you are, the bigger detective you are and you do your due diligence. It's really important to frame and get an accurate form representation for day one. The other thing is, also take a look at the temporality in, in the joint aspect and the additive symptoms that one can have and then gather the complete history is really important. Uh, I think there is a lot of like gray areas about internal medicine, not being confident enough to do a proper MSK exam. I think we always need to be getting confident on that, always document all those things. Now we have the ultrasound and the X-ray also confirmed that there is actually findings that we're having there is also important. And I think one of also the coolest thing about rheumatology in this case, for example, is that we do have a preliminary diagnosis. We continually follow up a patient and then we are gonna see longitudinally how this evolves. And that is something that is achievable and it's amazing from this field as well. Thank you so much, Franco. Uh, Alan, any final reflections or teaching points you want the people listening to take away from this case? Yes, and and I'm not I'm following Yusuf's plan, but we have time if there are people that we don't see other questions from the group to come back to because we right we finished the last aliquot. So my two final comments in two parts. Part one is if we're involved in the longitudinal care. I love what Franco said. We're still. Uh, thinking about them longitudinally. Our thought processes are not closed, they're open. So we call them a, a seronegative wrist, ankle, in, and back radiographic features. And we didn't say, oh, he's ankylosing spondylitis when he comes back, or he's rheumatoid arthritis. It makes us open-minded. Therefore, if his symptoms persist or there's other sites, we say, number one, is it time for endoscopic evaluation of his GI tract because it's not always overt. Bloody stool, crampy abdominal pain, what's in his ilium, what's in his colon, right? Before we, again, use drugs for the next six months or two years, what's going on? Similar point that when we learn about psoriasis in medical school and for me in residency training, we learn about extensor surfaces and classically knees, elbows, we look at nails but we also look at umbilicus and then there is psoriatic skin involvement on the flexural surface, which includes in the groin and inguinal folds and the perianal rectal area. So those are not 
right? There. And and I have had patients that I've sorted out who were unexplained oligoarthritis or monoarthritis, and I went looking hard to find the skin in not because they're in t-shirt and shorts and it's elbow or knee, and I got to go into perineum with a chaperone and look to come up with a unifying explanation. So it's still looking at thinking about the GI tract, looking in about the skin. Uh, and uh, that was part one. Uh, and then the other part was uh, that uh, when we started the story, circling all the way back, we said there's a family history of rheumatoid arthritis. Wrist was a classic joint. It still is in my learning, upbringing, in my teaching. So we always started thinking about rheumatoid arthritis. Then we heard, wait, something happened about a GI tract five years ago. And we started to turn to spondyloarthropathy. But I'm still going to teach young adults 18 to 40. I'm not disparaging anybody. And my current age is within two years of our patient. But 55 and 60 and 64 is not young adults. And, and I teach about that being young adults. Um, and, and then third is we had the remote history of, of an infection, particularly mycobacteria uh, and tuberculosis. So we had that cavity, not cavitary, no active cavity. We have the scarring in the apex. We do not seem to have by computed tomography, notable adenopathy. You know, is there still something brewing in a lymph node that once drain that area? We do not have a story of fever, chills, and sweats. We do not have a story of anemia of chronic disease, but I'm not able to shake that concern that I had at the beginning about uh, mycobacterial processes. Uh, and so it's, and now I'm repeating myself intentionally, we should not escalate in the care of him or the next hundred somewhat similar patients to biologic therapy, because that's exactly the future clinical problem solving case where we unmasked and in opportunistic infection that came about as a result of our aggressive immunotherapy. We wanted to help the patient get better in the arthritis, but with good intent, we might create another problem. And he's an at-risk person, uh, is my intuition. What I love these reflections. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, actually, uh, we have a little bit of time. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, or if you just want to chat with us, Feel free to like put it in the chat or talk to us directly. Uh, we actually have a rheumatology discussant in a week, exactly as well, who is an expert on ankylosing spondylitis. So for all of you room enthusiasts, in one week, we will also have a rheumatologist on, on a subspecialty session. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Franco, uh, for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. And if you have any questions or want to chat, feel free to stay on. I'm so appreciative of the time spent together. Thank you all. We're grateful for you.